Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session of uh, Growing Up in Science. Uh, my name is Wei Ji Ma. I'm a professor of neuroscience and psychology at uh, New, York, New York University. Um, and uh, Growing Up in Science is a mentorship series in which we highlight the stories behind the CV of, um, of practicing scientists. And we also have special events in which, in which we try to uh, address issues uh, pertaining to academic practice or uh, how science and society can can relate to each other uh, and today's event is of that second kind um, so just maybe a, as a little bit of a personal introduction uh, i myself have always uh, struggled with uh, the lack of relevance of my actual research to uh, society like I would care about doing science but I wouldn't really see how it would be useful for uh, for for society and uh, I've always tried to find ways to um, balance that and um, I think many many scientists are in the same position now there are obviously many ways to strike that balance between uh, science and relevance in some in some cases the science is actually high, highly relevant and in other cases, you, you can do something uh, in your free time. Uh, now, uh, there are scientists who, uh, whose work is so relevant that they, uh, that they get invited to be experts, uh, to testify before Congress, or those are the ones that uh, journalists would call if they, if they want to write a popular piece. Um, but most of us are just not there, either because of the topic of our research or because of our career stage. Uh, so uh, today's panel is really about how ordinary scientists who don't have special domain knowledge and uh, who just have some extra time on their hands could uh, could work to um, integrate uh, their their uh, science with um, with social change, uh, social justice, environmental environmental causes. Um, even in that space, uh, uh, yeah, there are lots of possibilities. Right? There are many ways in which people, scientists, get get active. Um, some of uh, some would help advocate for science funding, or they would um, help to try to elect scientists uh, to um, to different legislative bodies. Um, but uh, and and there's also ways to get in involved locally. So some people trying to make. Uh, academic, academia a better place, um, through mentorship or working on DEI issues. Those are all fantastic ways for our scientists to get active. Um, the speakers today, they are uh, on the side of um, actually using your skills as, and your background as a scientist to, uh, to further social and environmental causes. Uh, so I'm really excited to have um, Ingrid Paredes, Jonathan Cooperweiss, and Enya Sabi here as, uh, as speakers. Uh, they will introduce themselves. Uh, so uh, Ingrid, very briefly only, uh, Ingrid is from the March for Science. Uh, she's a co-chair of March for Science New York. Uh, Jonathan is uh, the president of the Scientist Action and Advocacy Network. And Linnea is the uh, founder and chair of the Science Policy Initiative at uh, University of Virginia. Um, I think there are some uh, additions to that, uh, Linnea, but you can uh, comment on that. Um, so um, all three of them are PhD students who are doing these things in their spare time. And uh, they, I, I, I admire them because of uh, the work that they're doing. And I'm hoping that we can have a conversation about how uh, we can help more, more scientists become, act, become active for social causes. Um, a little bit of logistics. Uh, first of all, uh, if you have questions for any of the speakers, you can type in the Q&A. Uh, if you want to uh, chat with each other or just uh, offer general remarks, go to the chat. Uh, I think it's also nice if we have a little bit of an idea of who we're talking with. So, if you are willing to just introduce yourself really briefly, like say uh, you're a PhD student in this field at this university, for example, uh, in the chat, then uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, and then without further ado, I, um, I'm going to let each of the panelists introduce their, themselves and their organizations. Ingrid. Thank you, Luigi. And thanks everyone for being here. I'm really excited to be with everyone. Um, 
and talk about some of the work that Marsh for Science does, as Weiji mentioned. And yeah, I, I'm an ordinary scientist. So a bit of background about me. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate in chemical engineering at NYU. Um, I work in nanoscience. Essentially what that means is I'm basically like a a chef, I stand in front of the fume hood, which you could think of as kind of like my stove, if you're not familiar, and I make soup all day. But instead of like, I thought of this like right beforehand, but it's a gross analogy, instead of like eating the, the reaction to kind of like as my reactor to test how good my experiment went, I do a lot of fundamental analysis. So I look at the skeleton of inorganic crystals that people are interested in for energy applications. So um, one common thing that people are real familiar with is like Silicon Valley, like solar cells, the batteries that are even making like our laptops run, our phones run to like watch and listen to this conversation. Um, my research is interested in, um, or the research I'm interested in, I should say, is about what materials we can look at um, beyond silicon. How can we really improve that performance looking at next generation semiconductors? Um, outside of the lab, I am, yeah, as Luigi mentioned, the co-chair of March for Science New York City. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, March for Science started as a global movement back in 2017. And similarly, in the vein of Women's March, it was a reactionary moment um, to the presidential election of 2016. But really what it was about was, I think, a lot of emotions that scientists have felt over time about a general disregard for science, particularly around the funding landscape um, for public, publicly funded science in the United States. And really what this um, day launched was a March on Washington that sprung up hundreds of different satellites all around the world that became tiny little, not really tiny, but localized satellite movements um, all around the globe. Um, in the city, we've become a bridge between activist groups and science outreach groups. That's kind of the niche that we found um, among our group, which is largely graduate students and undergraduates who, just like me, like um, are students by day, but have found passion for doing this work in their free time. Um, and our motto is educate to empower. So um, really briefly, like our flagship event is our March, of course, which of course, because of COVID has transformed into virtual events. But essentially, it's a day of action where we do kind of traditional, you can kind of think about it as like a community science fair, but rather than just having science outreach groups present in the public, we mix science outreach groups with science activist groups. So for example, like groups that are working in environmental studies or groups that are doing, for example, like water treatment chemistry, we'll place them in areas that are groups like Sunrise, groups like Fridays for Future, groups like We Act for Environmental Justice in New York to kind of bridge these um, gaps that I think a lot of scientists might feel about like hesitancy about jumping into places where they might not feel comfortable becoming an activist, becoming more vocal, and seeing how they can lend their skills or even just be a part of the conversation because there is a lot of overlap. And then on the other side of that is encouraging scientists who a lot of us like I'll speak to it more but like myself I wasn't very politically active before joining March for Science. Um, I like you know I voted but really largely kept my opinions to myself. We really try to encourage scientists to get out there and like advocate. So we do like um, a large part of our work in the last year has been of course around this year's election and educating people about the intersections of science and policy. For example, whether there is like healthcare or like education or immigration policy, what is the status of this policy? Like how did we get there? And like, what does the data say? And what does the community say that we should do next? So again, like bringing these conversations between um, activists and academia into one place. So yeah, I'm really excited um, to be here and to talk more. Awesome. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, next is Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm Jonathan. I'm a third year PhD student uh, in neuroscience at NYU. Uh, I'm going to share my screen so I can go through a few slides talking about scan. Uh, everyone can see this, yeah? Yes. All right. Um, so uh, I wanted to briefly start by talking about um, sort of the scan model and how we look at the landscape of, of science activism. So traditionally, science activism is done in, in sort of two ways. Um, so one is sort of direct advocacy from scientists directly to, to legislators. The other one is outreach, uh, where scientists speak directly to, to the public, trying to make it um, accessible uh, to them. At SCAN, we've taken a little bit of a, of a different approach. Um, and we sort of work in this way where 
we partner with NGOs or nonprofit organizations and do scientific research for them. Uh, and then they, with their domain knowledge and domain expertise, can uh, do the direct advocacy um, to legislators. So sort of the, the core idea is that uh, at SCAN is that we leverage our, our scientific skills, the ones that we already have, uh, for social good. Uh, so we're uh, mostly uh, graduate students, postdocs, and some professors who, who do pro bono science. Uh, the typical workflow is that we identify a cause that we care about, um, and that has some sort of potential to be turned into policy. Um, we partner with a nonprofit, like I mentioned, uh, and collaborate with them on, on some project. Uh, and typically, um, these take the form of either compiling evidence-based scientific reports uh, or doing some kind of data analysis or data visualization. And of course, we're, we're usually involved in, in follow-up with, with that organization as well. So I wanted to quickly just highlight two um, projects that we worked on in the past few years so you get some sort of idea of, of the scope of, of the things that we work on. So the first project is about um, juvenile cr and criminal justice. So uh, until recently, uh, New York and North Carolina were the only states to automatically try um, 16 and 17 year old criminal defendants as adults. Um, so this means that there's no parental notification on arrest um, they're processed in an adult criminal court and placed into an adult prison. And so obviously this, this didn't sit well with us uh, morally, but also a lot of us are in uh, neuroscience or psychology departments. And so we had some knowledge about why this isn't a good idea developmentally as well. And so we joined a coalition called Rage Stage uh, New York that was trying to uh, change this uh, legislation. So we compiled a report for them uh, on scientific support for raising the age of criminal responsibility. Um, and we made a bunch of different arguments um, like this one about uh, sort of how social maturity and cognitive ability uh, change uh, over development. And we made uh, some other arguments about, for example, how the brain responds to fearful stimuli at, at different ages. We also took some, a little bit of more direct advocacy. So here's Weiji talking about this at a New York City Council uh, committee. And then uh, Jen, a previous SCAN president at a Suffolk County Legislator press conference also, also talking about this. And this for the most part actually worked. So in April, 2017, this uh, legislation was passed. So it was cool to be sort of a small part of, of this large process. Now this, some of this work on juvenile justice has continued, mostly led by Ali Cohn and, and Gail Rosenbaum. Uh, so we compiled another report on uh, Miranda rights that's very similar. Uh, and Ali and Gail have developed a lot of scientific resources for, for the legal community. So very digestible sort of infographic type uh, information. Uh, and they've taught seminars to, to judges and lawyers using these resources and they're both still very, very active on, on this type of work. Okay, so the second project is, is uh, an environmental project uh, where we partnered with the New York City Environmental Justice uh, Alliance. And uh, the NYC EJA had uh, data about uh, regions in New York. Uh, those are the dashed lines on this map uh, where the city recommends that uh, sort of hazardous and potentially pollutant uh, infrastructure is built. And so we help them uh, visualize uh, this data on an interactive map that you can, you can check out online uh, and showed how these uh, regions sort of intersect with, with different uh, demographics in the city. Uh, so for example, here's those same regions, but now looking um, at where people of poverty typically live, um, where people of color in, in the city live, uh, and where people without health insurance live and sort of trying to show uh, that these regions will disproportionately affect uh, these types of uh, different types of, uh, of demographics. We've also worked on uh, a few other environmental projects. Um, so for a while now, we've, we've been involved in uh, the single use plastic bags movement uh, in New York and plastics more generally. Uh, and more recently, we've been doing another mapping project on looking at uh, supermarkets and the refrigerants uh, they use. Okay, so uh, one last point. So. Uh, we've also taken uh, a few other uh, roles other than these projects. So we've been put on a few panels on, on different topics. 
Uh, we do some direct advocacy to, to Congress and, and other places as well. Uh, and we put on a few workshops on, on science and, and policy. So I wanted to end kind of by making a pitch about why uh, a scientist would be interested in participating in, in advocacy. So one is that you can make use of your skills as a scientist on issues you're passionate about and without the need for being a policy expert or a domain specialist. Uh, you can develop work that, that is immediately useful. You can really collaborate with and, and learn a lot from, from advocacy groups, uh, build out new technical skills uh, and alleviate news related anxiety, which for me is, is, is always welcome. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alinea. Uh, you're still muted. I'm mute, okay. Thank you. Yeah, super inspiring to see what those other uh, groups are up to and hopefully I can add to the momentum here and describe another um, way that you can get involved. Um, I'm Linnea. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Virginia in civil and environmental engineering. I study uh, the environmental outcomes of water quality trading policy. And um, I'm co-president of the Science Policy Initiative at UVA. And as a part of that, I've founded um, the Direct Advocacy Committee Environmental Group, um, which is kind of the less of like the training and professional development side of, of our science policy efforts at UVA um, and more of the direct engagement and, and making a difference out in the world. So like SCAN, we provide science background for nonprofits. We're actually inspired to found this committee uh, by SCAN, but our focus has been more on supporting science-based litigation and helping uphold existing evidence-based policies. So in particular, we've worked a lot with opponents of fracked natural gas pipelines in West Virginia and Virginia. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we work, why we work and um, what we've gotten out of it so far. So environmental advocates often have uh, to interpret science without help from trained scientists. So say for example, you have an environmental advocate like a, a lawyer or a grassroots leader who's opposing a project that's likely to harm the environment. Um, the key to quantifying the environmental, economic, and social impacts of that project might be kind of locked in complicated science and engineering documents. Um, and they can hire a trained expert to interpret those documents, but really often they're interpreting that themselves. So we um, essentially try to interpret those documents for them where appropriate and provide science review that's timely and relevant to their advocacy. We have a really wide range of backgrounds. A lot of us are in environmental work, but some of us are totally outside of that field. And all we really share in common is a desire to see the science in the hands of the advocates where it can be used to help protect the environment. So the example project I'll talk about is our researching the impacts of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, which is a 300 mile fracked natural gas pipeline. Um, and we've worked with these organizations on this. And basically what the advocates needed after much back and forth was um, us to review MVP construction plans to cross a national forest, which is an area with a lot of legal leverage. So in this project, our advocate partners basically orient us to the relevant law and policy. They tell us what's coming up uh, in terms of legal and regulatory deadlines and they direct us to the specific construction documents that need scientific review. So what did we actually find here? Um, so we submitted a public comment um, that details five ways in which MVP misused models to estimate sedimentation. We find that they're using sediment control measures that are really inappropriate for the steep terrain in Jefferson National Forest. And they don't set any uh, threshold for acceptable sedimentation. And despite all of those uncertainties, the Forest Service declined to um, require water quality monitoring in the Jefferson National Forest. So these are all science concerns that we were able to identify using our, just our training as grad students um, that might not otherwise have been noted by the advocates and made its way onto the public record. And I'd like to emphasize last of all that SPIDAC members gain a ton of hands-on knowledge about how science is used in policy implementation. So this has been like a 
huge training, training opportunity for us. So if you take, for example, this Mountain Valley Pipeline final environmental impact statement, this is a technical legal document we've used all the time in our work. And we've gained real hands-on experience with how all of these federal agencies and state agencies implement environmental policy. And also, of course, what those policies are, how they have to be presented in these kinds of documents. Um, we're taking a critical eye. It's a great way to learn about that. Um, so tons of benefits to us as well. And uh, there's just there's power in numbers. So if you're considering, um, if you're inspired by what you're hearing so far today, consider finding a nonprofit group in your area that's advocating on an issue you care about. You can also join us uh, as you get started. My contact information is here. There's always increases your chances of success um, if you join a coalition. So I'm really excited to continue the discussion. Thank you so much, Lea. Um, just as a reminder, if you have any questions that come up during the discussion, please post them in the Q&A. So just to get the panel discussion started, uh, what I noticed is that um, you know, for SCAN and for SPI, uh, you're emphasizing the skills that you already have as scientists, uh, and those are particularly useful and very important to this kind of work. On the other hand, March for Science is a much more in inclusive organization, if you want, in the sense that non-scientists can also march and they can also support these causes. So uh, how, how do you all see that, that balance, right, between um, being inclusive to potential interested non-scientists versus actually um, being effective uh, given the kinds of training that scientists have. Uh, anyone who, who wants to get started on that. I can go. I think, yeah. Yeah, sure. I think um, the way that I see like our work fitting in, it took us a long time, honestly, to like also decide like where we wanted to fit in because a lot of these amazing groups like SCAN and SPI exist and provide scientists like really great training. But what we also saw was important for us is that like, as scientists, we've seen like along our academic careers, a lot of science outreach geared at kind of like the K through 12 and like undergraduate ages. But for like the voting public, that's like kind of where it stops, right? And we see like the pitfalls of like not having a scientifically engaged and literate society go. And that goes all the way from like, you know, the general public to congressional members of Congress who are dealing with example for the pandemic or for climate change because they don't have technical expertise. And I think the way that we see our work fitting in is kind of being that maybe like a gateway for scientists who might not have taken the opportunity to speak up before and for the public to also kind of interface like they might think of like, you know, scientists in that very stereotypical like white lab code kind of like cold calculated manner and kind of making that community First and so that organizations like SCAN, like SPI can then have that kind of like backing to scale up. It's kind of like, yeah, showing that relationship between individual and policy action. I absolutely agree that organizations like March for Science help empower organizations like SPI and SPIDAC. Um, I'll add in kind of the grassroots space, we're working a lot with grassroots leaders. So no, we don't really interface a lot directly with the public but we're helping to craft a science mission, a message in collaboration with community members um, that then can be available to the public. Um, so that's letting them advocate for themselves using our science message. Yeah, just to, the one thing I'll add on is, is to echo what Linnea said in, in her presentation, and that's that there's, you know, we're not, we're not inclusive in the same way that the March for Science might be, but there is a very low bar for what we mean by, you know, having scientific expertise. So we've had undergrads be super successful. Anybody who has any kind of scientific knowledge that, you know, you don't, you don't really know how valuable those skills might be until, until you start actually using them uh, in this type of work. Uh, and um, yeah, I think, I think, I think that's all I, I want yeah. to add. Oh, the one thing I'll, I'll maybe add also is that we also learn a lot of stuff uh, on the fly, like during projects. Uh, and that's something that, you know, might be easier for you than someone in, in the nonprofit world who's, who's, you know, already has a bunch on their plate and you know, doesn't have time to learn how to do X in X programming language or, or something like that. Um, so that I think is also an, an important uh, thing for people wanting to do something like this. 
Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that low bar. So what uh, what would you say to somebody who thinks that uh, they actually have to be an expert in a field in order to actually legitimately be able to contribute to that? So if I'm a psychology student and I uh, care about the environment, then I'm not an expert on that topic. So what, uh, what makes me even credible or uh, useful in uh, and uh, furthering an environmental cost then. Yeah, so that, that's kind of exactly why we at SCAN take, take this game of partnering with, with nonprofit organizations and pairing up with somebody who, who is that, that domain expert. We really, we really want to avoid, you know, any kind of situation where, uh, you know, we as a scientist are, you know, pretending that, that we know more about a certain domain than, than somebody who works in that domain full time. And so we can kind of reserve that, that sense of humility by, you know, doing the things that we already do every day that we're very good at that are transferable across domains. So, you know, reading scientific papers, doing uh, data analysis, writing summaries, like presenting things concisely, all the all these types of things we can do while while, you know, like I said, being preserving that that humility about the domain. Yeah, I think that willingness to learn and to listen is really important, like for whatever space, even as like a grad student, right? Like when you enter a lab, like I, when I entered my nanoscience lab, I had a completely opposite background. I worked on like big scale up reactors in industry. And I walked in now I'm working on these like tiny little reactors. I had no idea what the chemistry was. And I feel like my intuition as a scientist and like as a STEM student was kind of to be like, okay, like I know how to do this, maybe kind of like need to I think like try to be like more confident in myself than I might have been. And I really take a step back and be willing to listen and to you know, like do a lit review. And I think like similarly in activist spaces, just listening to people's lived experiences and the fact that you might care about a cause that you don't have maybe formal training in, but you know, like everyone has a reason to care about the environment, for example, and taking that and using that energy to motivate you and to find people that you can really learn from is important in the same kind of vein as like, yeah, like listening to domain experts doing a lit review and like taking that step. Uh, Linnea, did you want to add anything? I think this, yeah, this, this does come up as a concern, especially working on kind of litigation relevant science. Um, but we benefit a lot from being a very interdisciplinary group. So um, we're all people with science training and on the specific work we've done, we've had at least one of us with pretty specific knowledge of the area. So there, whoever that is can kind of take the leadership on that specific research question. Um, so we really do work together. Um, and as grad students, we tend to be pretty used to um, learning new things. So uh, it can be a little scary to step out of your domain expertise a little bit, but um, I, we try to be like, you know, work slowly and flexibly and, and no stupid questions and, and that kind of thing when, we, when we're working on these projects together. Awesome. Yeah, so all of you uh, talk regularly to non-scientists in, in your collaborating organizations, for example. So uh, what is the hardest part of that communication? Like, can you give an example of something that went terribly wrong or uh, as an, an obstacle that you had, have to, had to overcome in, in that communication? I have one that comes to mind immediately. <laughs> right. um, so working with... Uh, lawyers, I won't talk about what project it was or who we were speaking with, but we were, we were starting a partnership with a group of lawyers and um, about halfway into the meeting, um, everybody kind of got afraid because the lawyers were asking us to create science that wouldn't, wasn't going to be publicly available, we weren't going to be able to publish, and the scientists had this attitude of like, well, this is open science, this is, this is for the public good, we want to be able to share all of this. Um, that's kind of the scientific ethics. So there was like a direct conflict of those objectives between lawyers and scientists. Um, so while that specific partnership, you know, all, all on good terms didn't work out, um, we did have to really carefully find organizations and individuals who were willing to work with us as a volunteer organization with a lot of turnover, um, limitations as volunteers, just kind of putting out there exactly what our philosophy was, was really important to developing a good relationship. Yeah, um, I can't think of a, of a specific example, but that that idea of um, what what kind of what Linnea just, just said at the end definitely definitely rings true. Um, working with nonprofits, you know, they do have high turn, turnover, they do have limited resources, a lot of them, you know, sometimes won't get back to you. So I think, you know, you being very organized, 
um, and being very, you know, persistent about about the things you want you want to work on and that you actually want want to get done and following up and all the kind of things that that are sort of sensible to do. But um, you know, if you do them, you're you're much more likely to to be successful in in actually you know forming a, a collaboration that that's mutually beneficial. Um, I think I think those are are both important. Great. Um, yeah. So, yeah. No, no. Go ahead. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, we go to the first uh, question uh, by uh, Lauren, um, a second year MA student at NYU. Um, Lauren's question is: Since there are so many social issues, how do you choose which one uh, to work on? And I think this relates to what uh, Linnea was saying a moment ago: is you have to carefully pick your partner. So, how do you uh, pick the organizations that you collaborate with? Uh, for us, it's been a matter of um, looking carefully at what's going on in the community and what the big issues are, um, so we can really turn to those community partners and let their energy inform what we're doing. Um, we didn't have any research questions when we went to our preliminary partners and kind of asked them what they're working on. Um, so I think, you know, follow the scent of what's active in your community that also has science needs um, and don't go into it with too many, you know, it's like, oh, I have my research on this area and I want to like use that in my science advocacy. Can you use it? Um, that's a less helpful approach, unfortunately. Yeah, same. March for Science in particular is still largely like more like a social movement. So we listen like in some ways, even though we have this infrastructure now, we are reactionary. So for example, um, working with like what with the moment commands, like climate has been, even though we're not a climate focused organization in that regard, like prioritizing that has become really important to us because it's like what the moment commands. So we listen to a lot about what's going on like globally, nationally, and then what our partners are interested in working in. And then when we don't have partners, we kind of just like seek out people we know are in this space. Yeah. Yeah, for us, I, I find that that the projects and the issues that are successful in SCAN are so so one is one factor is the um that local nonprofits tend to be a little bit more responsive than like a big global or a big national um, organization. So um, we're mostly based in, in New York with some, some people elsewhere. So um, typically the, the New York, you know, local organizations that we, we can actually go to or meet with or talk to more often um, are the ones that uh, are typically better, better partners. Also, um, maybe one thing about the organization of SCAN. So SCAN is a very, you know, horizontal organization like I uh, you know send out emails and, and do some organizational work but but really it's driven by the products that are successful are really driven by the issues that people are very very passionate about it at scan and those are the ones that get done because everybody in scan is obviously doing this in their spare time uh, so I think yeah being being very very passionate about an issue and being willing to seek out nonprofits and email many nonprofits that look like they're doing good work in the space and might benefit from from some scientific uh, advising, uh, I think, is also important. Thank you. Um, so the second question is from uh, Abe, and uh, the question is inspired by uh, Jonathan's slide on um, on plastic bag uh, fees. Uh, the, the broader question is uh, what the balance is between uh, data gathering and analysis uh, versus advocacy work. And in, in fact, the first part of Abe's question is, you know, did we did scan gather these data them, uh, themselves or uh, how, how did uh, where they collected? Yeah, so for the um, plastics project specifically, um, and I actually think most scan projects, um, which you can correct me if, if I'm mistaken, but um, the data and the studies already exist somewhere and then we, you know, seek them out and find them. So for the plastic bags, we were looking at effectiveness of, of different uh, plastic bag bans or plastic bag fees or other types of, of legislation um, in New York City and then nationally and globally on, on the different kind of levels of the projects we've worked on. Uh, and so those studies already exist. Like if a study doesn't exist, we're not going to go out and do like an effectiveness like study. We don't, we don't really have the, the bandwidth for that. Um, but there are a lot of existing studies that that since this is kind of an issue that people care about a lot and so for us it's reading papers and and, and compiling those um so for that project definitely the focus is on uh, that type of data analysis and for the most part 
for scan projects, we typically work with data that, that's already collected. So the, the other project I showed um, on waterfront mapping, they, they already had um, all of that data as well. Um, and same thing for the, the uh, supermarket project, like they already had the data um, and they're collecting more data, like the nonprofit themselves is, is collecting more data as we go along and we're helping with, with the more technical aspects of it. Ingrid and Linnea, and do you want to say something about that balance between data analysis and advocacy? Yeah, in um, the legal space, the way that I'd frame that question is, you know, we're reading these technical reports, we're not going to try to redo the engineering for the construction of the, of the pipeline. So how we've, we've phrased that, that kind of works for both the lawyers and us is to say, we question the conclusion that MVP drew based on their models. So we're kind of questioning their hypotheses rather than um, trying to, to redo the science. Cause it's really important that we don't as, as grad students try to like, try to jump into that. Yeah, we operate in much the similar way to the other two groups where we just look at existing science that's out there. And then across our team, we'll kind of do like our internal kind of peer review and decide like what our stance is around that. Yeah, and I think that's actually a very interesting commonality between these organizations that um, deliberately you choose to not engage in primary research, but you're uh, providing that uh, advocacy and interpretation and application layer on top of the primary research yeah um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, effectiveness so um, what are the successes that you're proud of what uh, wh what evidence do you have that you have been successful what are your measures of success i think my my immediate measure of success is always the direct feedback we get from from our partners and from nonprofits we collaborate with. So if they say that, you know, what we've uh, produced is, is useful for them in their advocacy work, that is already kind of a win for me. So um, that happened, for example, I mean, it happens on, on a number of projects, but specifically the waterfront project, like the NYC EJ has told us that that's, you know, the map and having it online and being able to walk through kind of the story that they wanted to tell is very, very useful when, when they're talking to, to um, different groups. Um, another measure of success, I think, is of course when you when you see legislation actually get passed on on something that you've been working on. So the uh, first example that, that I talked about with, with the juvenile justice or plastic bags uh, as well, having seen that turn into legislation in, in New York is also kind of exciting. So obviously um, that, but that you know that can't happen with every project, like especially because you know we're just a small part of of, of a larger process of, of advocacy, but. Yeah, those two measures are, are typically good feedback. Yeah, it's a bit hard to track, but definitely like that feedback from partners is really important. One quick thing that I thought of was a little bit anecdotal, but one of the early projects that we have worked on was, um, for those of you who might've been in grad school or familiar, like back in 2018, I believe, there was this like graduate student tax that was proposed that was basically going to tax graduate students on their tuition on when our stipend is in reality a small fraction of the total cost that the university has on us. Um, and it was one of the first things that March for Science New York City was like, okay, let's be a part of the larger grad student movement that's organizing in New York City. And it was my first experience trying to organize anything. And like, I got, like first it was like one person in my department who agreed to go. Then the next day it was like two more people who agreed to go. And I think even just getting that first person to me was like, personally, like something that was like, okay, like I can do this and then we can do this like slowly over time. And then that network growth has really been something I think March for Science has seen, like even though our movement has become very decentralized, it's because people are taking this work and this energy, like maybe to groups that they are um, involved with otherwise. Like one of them, like Bianca did mention, like seeing like legislation pass, like New York passed its own version of a Green New Deal last year. And that was something that like all the climate groups that had been in this space for a while were like, Wow, like regardless of like whatever small part you played in it, you were part of the conversation. Yeah, I think um, every the the metrics and uh, that have been mentioned are, are really valid. I'd also add just like natural growth of the organization feels a lot like 
success. Um, I feel like we're doing something important because I get people emailing me about it without doing <laughs> a huge, huge amount of recruiting, which I should be doing more of. Um, but that's that's been really great. So I'll also tell just a quick story. So we started, we did a couple of smaller projects. And then when we got involved on pipeline advocacy, we worked on the Atlantic Coast pipeline for five months. We worked really hard as a group. I was really proud that everybody kind of stuck with it. I had a really dedicated team of volunteers um, putting in a few hours a week consistently, and that felt like a success metric. The day after we submitted our big final report, the whole project was canceled, <laughs> which was amazing and, and a win for our community advocates, but it was also, um, you know, obviously the end of our uh, contribution, our non-existent contribution. But the success from that was that um, our advocate partners were impressed with what we did, and we connected with several more organizations after that. So that that felt like, like a success. And on this current MVP project, um, you know, the successes are, so we submitted the project just this morning, actually, the comment, the document that we um, commented on was revised. So we'll get to learn to see if they actually made any revisions based on our comments. And even if they didn't, our comment can still be useful in a courtroom. So uh, kind of a slow burner, but that will be how we how we measure our impact here. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great point about recruitment. Sorry, Weiji. Yeah. That's a great point about recruitment. I think like just knowing that like once your work that maybe if you are interested in starting your organization or you're part of an org that's like in its early stages, once the work is like beyond that first group and kind of gets rolling, that feels really good. And I think that's a sign to like that what you're doing has value to the community that you're serving, regardless if it's like the public or Congress people or other grad students. Yeah, one, one more thing that I that I wanted to add really quick. Um, is um, it is also very, very rewarding. And I think sh just shows that, that people are interested uh, in doing similar work um, is seeing sort of organizations inspired by SCAN pop-ups or so something like, you know, it's more, you know, like SPIDAC, but we also have some sister organizations at Penn and at UBC um, that we've collaborated with at different points in time. And so that is, you know, just having more scientists that want to do activism, activism and advocacy work um, I think is a, is a sign of effectiveness as well. One thing that I really like about the March for Science is their emphasis on intersectionality, right? So the, um, the, the for example, that environmental destruction often disproportionately affects minority communities. Uh, so your organizations, um, are, are they, in what way are you trying to address intersectionality? And if you haven't done so yet, what, what, what could you imagine uh, doing? Yeah, for March for Science, and I think that conversation took time for the movement to build as well. Like, um, for those of you who might be familiar with like March for Science from the beginning, at the start, it really was about like those things that I had mentioned in the beginning, which I think is like where a lot of scientists start, like funding for the sciences, thinking about like science like this big picture way, and much less so about the scientific community. But I think like for us, like in like I'm a woman, I am Filipino American, and a lot of our team also belongs to underrepresented minorities in STEM. And I think we just, we like we're like these are not just like data points that we're addressing, but also lived experiences of scientists. This was like one thing that really hit us, for example, was like when the travel ban hit like in 2018, and it was actually affecting like grad students, postdocs, faculty that we knew, and that was when we had to take a moment and be like, you know, like we cannot like I think we hit them in the beginning, like the separation between science and society, like. There really is like none, like on the point that it's like a like science is fueling everything, and then b that we are also humans like living in the society, and that we have to advocate for that and be a part of that and protect the society before the science is actually done. And then in that way, what we started to do was like not just working with science outreach and like activist groups in the spaces related to that science, like climate or healthcare groups, but listening really closely to groups like Black Lives Matter and like indigenous groups that have been organizing around climate for a long time, but their voices might not have been as loud as like the mainstream movement. And then really taking that time to like, like for me, like I had almost like zero knowledge about like what the abolitionist movement, for example, was like until maybe earlier this, yeah, earlier this year, like a lot of people, like when conversations around defund the police really started. And again, like to Jonathan's point, that's when we had to be like, okay, we don't know, this is making us uncomfortable, but like, let's sit with it, let's talk about it, and like, let's be open about learning about it. So then what we did was like, basically like host a series of events where like, this is like the literature on abolition. 
and this is like how we're going to go forward about this. So I think just yeah, like that willingness to like talk about it was really important. Acknowledging a lot of the times like where we don't know or like where we made mistakes. Yeah, so I think I think for us, we've we've also tried to have some of those similar conversations at, at our meetings, and I've tried to, to to open those up for people to have have a dialogue about anti-racism in science and, and all these types of issues that, that are very important. Um, we we helped growing up in science put on some of the anti-racism events and co-sponsored some of those. So people within SCAN have also you know been involved in trying to to open up the floor for for you know, people from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds to, to have kind of a space to, to be able to speak. And also for, you know, people outside of those groups to, to be able to reflect and, and try to make a difference in, in the academic sphere. Um, and then some this point of intersectionality also can come across in, in specific projects as well. So, um, you know, if, if, if it is, you know, if it is appropriate and like uh, important within, within the scope of a project and then, then we try to bring it up with, with uh, the nonprofits that, that we're working with to, to make it an emphasis. In SPY, we did um, a number of uh, specific actions to address um, to address intersectionality, but I won't get into those here because specifically I'm talking about SPY DAC today. Um, as a committee, we were really laser focused on the pipeline issue, but I don't think that means that we were ignoring the um, the social dimensions of that. There are a ton of equity concerns in um, these, these, these projects almost always go through, um, uh, th through poor communities because that's where, that's where they, the eminent domain is cheaper basically. So by definition almost, they're environmental justice problems as well. And I think what this highlights is it's, we've learned so much from being a part of a really highly organized environmental coalition where there's such a diversity of strategies um, that even though we were really focused on sedimentation, we were also focused on um, how can we make this project better or how can we end this project ultimately would be the goal. Um, so while we weren't focused on the environmental justice issues because they didn't have the legal leverage, unfortunately, um, I think that you know our work is still contributing to the overarching problems, solving the overarching problems that projects like the pipeline uh, bring to light. Thank you. We're going to go so, to some questions. One from Barbara. Are your organizations providing a science-based consulting interface that is otherwise, in your opinion, completely lacking? Yeah. Um, that's a great question um, because there are scientists in the nonprofit space. And I think something that we have to be a little bit aware of um, is that we're not trying to overtake you know professional scientists who might be um, in a consulting position um, might be in a paid consulting position those kinds of things are really important but um, especially working on local issues we have found a real lack of scientists who are willing to speak out about about these issues and it's been um, really helpful you know our, our partners have said that it's been really helpful to empower their message um, as scientists using basically you know our our degrees as as leverage to um, give credence to to what they're arguing for so is is it completely lacking there are scientists involved and some of them um, play a, do play an important role but um, there's definitely need for more um, community science to be involved in these issues rather than just a few experts there's definitely a need yeah, I completely agree with what Linnea said, and it comes back to what I said earlier about um, sort of projects with with local organizations being more successful than you know national or global organizations, and that's often because of this point. Like, if there's a very big uh, national organization that has uh, you know a, a bigger budget and uh, larger sort of infrastructure, they're much more likely to already have somebody who you know is a, a, a data analyst or a software engineer um, or who's a science you know specialist uh, expert in you know environmental science or, or whatever the, the the cause might actually be but at the local level a lot of these nonprofits can be uh, lacking uh, in terms of that having that that sort of same infrastructure that the larger organizations will benefit from uh, and I think that's where we can we can come in and, and actually be effective thank you um, so uh, I, I would like to go to the more personal aspect of 
being a scientist activist. Uh, so what keeps you personally going, right? Uh, apart from all the uh, rational reasons, what makes you angry, what drives you, what keeps you up at night? So I have I have very much the, the same problem that that Weiji spoke about earlier at the very beginning, uh, and that's that uh, I do feel while I really enjoy doing science, I do feel like my science is is very very removed from any kind of real world impact. Um, and as someone who you know constantly you know consumes news, like I'm always on Twitter, I'm like pretty up to date on, on things that are happening. Uh, I care about you know local issues, like you know issues that are global and national. So you know, it, it doesn't sit right with me to, to do nothing. Uh, and my job, while I enjoy it, does feel like uh, a little bit of, of, of doing nothing in that specific uh, sense. Uh, so for me, that that is very intrinsically motivating to, to keep sort of doing this. Um, it was also easy for me to sort of get involved. Like, you know, I got to NYU and the scan infrastructure was already there and it was very easy to join and kind of immediately be surrounded by other people who were very passionate about um, doing this type of work, which I think was also uh, important. And then finally, beyond that, I mean, there, there are just very specific issues. Like I care a lot about environmental issues. And so like having, uh, you know, a very driven passion for specific issues, I think also keeps one sort of motivated to, you know, keep trying to, to, to make a difference. Yeah, I had touched on it maybe a little bit before, but for me, it's always been, um, I think I have like a bit of a strange background, even though I have like a very traditional chemical engineering like training. I've also I've always also been like a bit of a bookworm and like really love to read and be involved in like science journalism. And for me, like scientific literacy has been like such an important um, thing to me. And just seeing in the way that this has not been or has been tried to be implemented like in our education system has been like super important to me like even as an engineer like you know like I'm sure like for the other scientists here like the training that we get in like the humanities and like in writing communication even skills that we are using every day now like in our positions as organizers are not always the skills that we get like in our formal education and that is kind of like where I had started like thinking about like okay like it's important that I know how to like read write and that that slowly turned into like advocacy over time and that has just like every time I read something that's like I mean COVID for example just like all the misinformation that we see it's just like an explosion of like all these causes like all these issues like coming into one thing so that's like something that gets me like riled up. <laughs> yeah. um, I totally agree that it's kind of um, satisfying to sit down and focus and use my skills on this kind of advocacy in light of everything that's going on in the news, it feels like some self care in a way. <laughs> um, so I, I definitely, that definitely resonated with me as well. Um, there's another point that I wanted to make too. Oh, I wanted to bring up something that like, you know, when I first started as a graduate student, my advisor gave me some really great advice. And that was, you know, your, your PhD is about turning into the kind of person that you want to be when you graduate with your PhD and you're set, you're setting yourself up for this is your, you know, four to seven, whatever years to develop into the type of person that you want to be. So um, I think of that in terms of what I'm adding to my CV. I want to, <laughs> I want to um, be able to, to learn and gain these skills and gain these networks um, and also feel like I'm actually making a difference with this time as a graduate student and not waiting until I'm an expert down the road. Um, there's a question from Elisaveta. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. So let's say, say there's an issue I care about, but uh, did not find any group organization that works on it and, and would like to contribute to the cause uh, myself and maybe gather a group of people who are willing to help. How do you do that? How do you get an organization started from scratch? Or uh, is there, are there other ways that you could go about um, addressing the cause that you care about? Social media honestly has been super helpful just finding like minded people. I think that like conversations around like even science communication, science policy, maybe were not so prioritized within academia, like and even even much more largely. So I think the conversation is changing. I think it's because people have been able to find like minded folks, like even without like 
um, outside of their institutions or outside of their departments. I can say like personally, like for me, like how I got involved was I had one really loud friend who was like in activism and his name is Omar. And um, he, like when I met him, like I, I was like very shy and like quiet person. Omar basically introduced himself as being like an activist, like straight out the womb. And like uh, he, he had never been involved with science advocacy either, but I did know that he was someone who was vocal. Hi, <laughs> oh, you're so big now. <laughs> Um, very vocal. Oh, that made my day. <laughs> like, <laughs> very vocal um, about other causes that he had cared about. And I just took that and I sat and I, and I just had a conversation with him. And I was like, do you want to go with me to this? And I was like, or can I go with you to this? And I just started listening a lot. And even though that wasn't directly like in the space that we're working in now, it gave me that kind of like um, mindset of like, okay, like these are kind of, sort of the skills that I might need to learn. These are really the kinds of people like in this space. And then just like slowly, it, it really takes like a lot of time and patience, I think. But I think if you just reach out to that one person, like I said, it'll kind of have like this like avalanche effect over time. Yeah, I completely agree with with what, what Ingrid is saying about finding like-minded people and finding a community of people that, that care about the same issues that, that you care about. I think that is, you know, a very, very important first step. I'll also add that it's not that you you have to find a nonprofit that works on exactly what you want to do and, and find like you can make a difference just within yourself and within your community, um, however big that community is. I think the reason that that we try to, to partner with nonprofits is that we want to avoid kind of the situation where, you know, we as academics create something and we publish it somewhere and then no one reads it and it has like no kind of impact in actually changing legislation or in being used in advocacy work. So. I think if you try to be mindful about ways in which you can create something that either real world people will read or people in the advocacy space might run across or that other people in your community might find useful, that's sort of the most important thing. And that I think is easy to do when you have a nonprofit sort of advising you about what's useful, but it's not that that is the only way, way to do it. I'd also add there's uh, a lot of resources to help with this. Um, when SpyDoc first started a couple years ago. I just started going to SCAN meetings and seeing how they organize. So um, learning from other organizations that are doing what you're interested in um, in the same space is super helpful. Yeah, related to that, if anybody at any point wants to come to a SCAN meeting, like you can just, just email us like from the SCAN website or email me, find me and email me and like anybody can just come. Like we're super open to, to people just joining, especially now that everything is virtual. It's super easy. So if you want to come and just sit in and see how it is or you want to join and work on something, like feel free to. Yeah, in, in fact, that's uh, probably good if all three of you post in the chat how what people should do if they are interested in getting involved. In the meantime, we're going to take uh, another question. Um, perhaps all of us struggle with balancing the pressures of academic life and our need to make a difference in issues of larger impacts. Uh, any suggestions or tip what, what has worked for you? So that resonates with me. Uh, I, I once had a colleague who shall remain unnamed who uh, said about outreach that uh, th this colleague thought that um, uh, they rather saw their students uh, do more research than engage in outreach. Right? And uh, it's true that if you want to be competitive for a research career, then um, that, that requires a lot. So um, what has uh, your, how has you, have you drawn that balance? Has your advisor been supportive? Or what would you say to people whose advisor might not be so supportive? I think what the, the advice of Linnea's PhD advisor like really resonated with me. I feel like when I had started out in outreach, like for me, um, science education outreach always felt like personally more important. But I agree, like I felt pressure, especially as a younger grad student, like that I need to prioritize public uh, publishing and doing research in the lab. But then I think at the end of the day, it's like to what Linnea's point is, like the when you're in grad school, you're really shaping the kind of skills and the career that you want to have. I think having those goals and mindsets like to ground you are really important. But I will say to Ouija's point, like my my advisor has been very supportive. But I think that's in part also because I set like pretty early on, like saying like what is important to me for these skills. And I think finding a mentor that has that understanding of you is really important. Yeah, I think I think for me, you know, on on the one hand, I'm it's sort of the same thing that Ingrid said, but on the one hand, I'm, I'm very fortunate, like Weiji is my advisor. So he invited me here. He 
helped found Scan. Obviously, he's very supportive about uh, these uh, this type of work. Um, but on the other hand, that that was very intentional. Like I, I wouldn't want to be in a lab where my advisor wasn't supportive of uh, this type of work or really any kind of interest outside of science that, that I wanted to cultivate during my time in graduate school. So my advice to, to people that uh, kind of are looking into, into grad school or in, into a PhD is, is to really think about the kind of PhD that you want and try to find mentors and really prioritize mentors that, that will help you grow in, in that role. For me, that's, that's the most important thing, more than you know how accomplished a certain PI is, how um, uh, the, the specific type of work that, that you'd be doing in the lab to me, to me, kind of the, the overall environment and, and the mentorship aspect is, is the most important. Yeah, I mentioned the quote from, from my advisor. And, and so I'm very grateful to have the uh, support of both of my advisors. Um, some of my members don't have that much support. Um, and I like to emphasize and I think we can always do more of this in, in science policy organizations is really emphasize and find ways to support the CV of our members. So it's like, if somebody is taking initiative on something, I'll say like, all right, you're leading this, put that on your CV. Um, if we're, we're thinking about ways that we can turn our work into an academic manuscript, which it's harder for advisors to argue with. Um, so really, not, not that I'm in this for my CV by any means, but it's really important that we find ways to like make it match the traditional um, you know, metrics for success in academia. So I try to do that in SpyDAC. Yeah, and by the way, as, as, we, as we close out, I'm sorry, Ingrid. Um, as, we're, uh, as SpyDAC is currently a committee in SPY, but we are um, kind of restructuring that. So please do keep in touch. We're probably going to be um, re restructuring soon. Yeah, I was just gonna add that like journals, like there's Journal for Science Policy and Governance, which actually prioritizes early career researchers, like undergrads, grad students, postdocs, which is a great place to get started. Um, science Policy Network is a great resource. And like even like larger journals like Lancet, which is a big medical journal and Nature has really started publish, uh, publishing like policy briefs. So I think there's a change, like a shift in culture that's happening over time within the scientific community and finding these outlets as a grad student now might be yet more difficult to navigate, but the opportunities are, are coming up. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we are slowly uh, reaching the end here. So we'll take one more round of uh, questions. So if you have a question now, this will be a good moment. Um, so how do you draw in new members to your organization? And uh, particularly, uh, uh, do you, how do you, make sure that all levels are represented. For example, I know that in SCAN, it's actually been a bit of a challenge to get faculty uh, involved. Um, how could that be improved or is that even important? Yeah, so I'll talk, maybe I'll talk about some of the ways we, we do um, recruitment, if you, want, if you want to call it that. Um, so one thing we do is we always make sure to talk about SCAN at um, sort of department events or to incoming, uh, you know, classes of, uh, of students so that they're aware of what we're doing and that they can join if, if they want to. Um, that's one thing. I think the second thing is having like a website. Like I get a lot of emails just, just from people that come across our website and, you know, think it's interesting and want to sit in on a meeting uh, and having a social media presence on, as well on Twitter or, you know, our members talking about the, the, the projects that we're doing. Um, what Weiji talk, is talking about, about you know, have, it being a struggle to have, uh, to get faculty to join. I do think that's an issue. Like it would be nice if we had more faculty members like really invested. Um, it's hard because they're obviously very busy, but I think trying to be a little bit persistent and um, kind of focusing on uh, issues that they specifically might uh, care about and trying to get kind of loop them into sort of what Linnea is saying, trying to loop them into to leading a project or co-leading a project with a student um, is sort of one way to, to try to do that. Um, another issue we've had at SCAN is that, you know, we're, we were founded and are kind of mostly based in the psychology and neuroscience departments at NYU. So a lot of our members are from those two departments, which, which is fine. But um, I think also trying to reach out across departments and get sort of a broader coalition of members um, that's a little bit more interdisciplinary, kind of like what sounds like you guys have at, at Spy Deck, Linnea, I think uh, is also important and would be really nice to have sort of a more interdisciplinary perspective. 
I just kind of slipped in in the last answer that we're um, rebranding and that is in part so that we can better represent what we're actually doing and um, again get that kind of natural growth to our organization so um, we're represent we currently represent four or five universities and about have about 45 members um, and we're hoping that having a an organizational structure that's not nested under UVA um, can help to um, make members from other universities feel comfortable taking on leadership positions. Um, so all of that is kind of in the works. We're in a kind of teenager phase of our organization and we're trying to um, trying to formalize it all right now. Yeah, something that's been helpful too has been like having different levels of engagement for folks. Like we have volunteers who are like just for single day events, volunteers who maybe only have time to send an email to their friends or send an email to their department about what's going on. And we value those things just in the same way, Linnea. Like we put them like, put it on your put it on your resume, put it on your CV that you're a volunteer with our organization. And building that um, kind of credibility to it also helps people feel more included in the organization over time. Um, so yeah, having that like, kind of like scale up, having people like tap in where they can is always good. Yeah, those are, those are wonderful suggestions. Um, and, and maybe to wrap up, um, Here's a uh, sort of a big, um, big scale question, large scale question from Barbara. Uh, do you have any advice on how to change the culture in academia to make these extracurricular efforts recognized for their invaluable impact? Right, and uh, that's actually a really broad question. You could ask that about uh, teaching, mentoring, outreach, advocacy, uh, activism. Right, those are not, even though you can put them on your CV. They're not like like was we discussed earlier, like the traditional metrics of of success in a research career. So, uh, do you have any thoughts on what should change in the system uh, to uh, value those uh, activities more? Yeah, I think I think it's a little hard for for this change to to come directly from grad students, kind of while they're while they're working in these organizations, but at the system level. Um, what I would love to see is uh, more hiring decisions made on on a generally sort of holistic process. Like I think right now and traditionally the, the, the scheme is very rewarding to publishing papers and that's kind of where it ends. Um, but there are so many other, I think, facets of academic life um, that I would love to see sort of rewarded at that level. You know, one of which being science advocacy and uh, that kind of work, but you know, also teaching, mentoring, like all these kinds of things, I think are starting to be more involved in the conversation for um, faculty decisions. But I do think it's something that it is taking a very long time to change. Um, but hopefully, that sort of progress keeps happening. And so that is kind of one of the reasons why it would be nice to have you know more faculty in, involved in in scan because I know someone like Weiji cares a lot about this, and so at faculty meetings, he you know is definitely bringing that that perspective. Whereas uh, PI who has never attended a scan meeting or doesn't know anything about what some of these organizations do is probably not going to do that. Um, so yeah, I think I think that change slowly happening at at, at the faculty level um, is hopefully what what will happen going forward. Yeah, agreed. I think finding allies like in um, especially in admin and like senior faculty level is super important, especially for grad students. And then also just like higher level, just yeah, like to Beyonce's point, like funding these programs, there are like, you know, sometimes school will have like center for case through 12 STEM outreach or center for civic engagement, but really prioritizing these relationships, like, you know, like beyond the paragraph that PIs might write on the broader impacts portion of like the proposal, but really understanding and building relationships around these metrics rather than just it being like a simple line on a proposal is really important. I would just say, um, yeah, I agree with both of those um, and all the way through, you know, hiring decisions, but also tenure review and um, what's expect, you know, what's expected of graduate students um, not to, I, I always feel guilty asking graduate students to do more volunteer work because many of us are already very stressed. So um, advisees giving their advisor advisors giving their advisees space and encouragement to do that is really key to have buy-in from advisors. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks also for posting uh, your contact information in the chat. I know that um, uh, anybody who's interested in either joining any of these organizations or starting their own organizations should feel free to contact any of us here, including myself. Um, 
And uh, I would just want to ask you, do you have any concluding thoughts, uh, any, uh, uh, anything that you would like to add to the discussion? This is a great conversation and I'm really happy to have been a part of it. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, same, same here. I, I would echo that. And also, yeah, I would, I would, on top of encouraging people to maybe join a scan meeting and sort of see what it's like, I'd really encourage people to try to set up their own, if not a similar to scan organization, just any kind of advocacy organization. And I'm, you can reach out to me. I'm sure you can reach out to anyone on this panel, not only to, to you know, join the organization, but if, if you want some advice or some help about how to structure an organization, how to get started, um, all any of those types of things, like I think we would be happy to help with that. Same. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here and for everyone participating in the conversation. And you know, welcome to all the new people and like the science organizing family. Wonderful. Thank you so much. The recording is going to be posted on the Graph and Science uh, YouTube channel. I'm also going to, we are also going to tweet about it. So hopefully that will be easy to find. Thank you all very much uh, for joining us. Um, and if you want to be on the Growing Up in Science mailing list for um, future events, then you can find uh, the link on uh, the Growing Up in Science website if you haven't already. Uh, uh, again, uh, thanks, thanks for being here. Take care.